Thermo part one, temperature, heat, and expansion. Define temperature in terms of molecular motion. Describe how heat flows. Describe how a thermometer works. Explain the connection between internal energy and heat. Describe how the quantity of heat that enters or leaves a substance is determined. Explain why the specific heat capacities of different substances are different. Describe how water's high specific heat capacity affects climate. Explain how matter changes when heated or cooled. Explain why ice floats on water. The big idea. When matter gets warmer, the atoms or molecules in the matter moves faster. All matter, solid, liquid, and gas, is composed of continually jiggling atoms or molecules. Because of this random motion, the atoms and molecules in matter have kinetic energy. The average kinetic energy of these individual particles causes an effect we can sense, warmth. Whenever something becomes warmer, the kinetic energy of its atoms or molecules has increased. It's easy to increase kinetic energy in matter. You can warm a penny by striking it with a hammer. The blow causes the molecules in the penny to jostle faster. If you put a flame to a liquid, the liquid also becomes warmer. Rapidly compress air in a tire pump and the air becomes warmer. When the atoms or molecules in matter move faster, the matter gets warmer. Its atoms or molecules have more kinetic energy. For brevity in this chapter, rather than saying atoms and molecules, we'll simply say molecules, by which we mean either. So when you warm up by a fire on a cold winter night, you are increasing the molecular kinetic energy in your body. Discover how much heat can a balloon hold. Fill a balloon with air and fill a second similar balloon with water. Hold a lighted match close to the bottom of the air-filled balloon. Caution, do not touch the match to the balloon. Remove the match if the balloon looks as if it is about to rupture. Now hold a lighted match near the bottom of the water-filled balloon. Observing. What happened to each of the balloons when exposed to the flame? Predicting. How long do you think it would take for the water-filled balloon to rupture if the flame were not removed? Making generalizations. What role does water play in preventing the rupture of the balloon? 20.1 Temperature. The quantity that tells how hot or cold something is compared with a standard is temperature. We express temperature by a number that corresponds to a degree mark on some chosen scale. Nearly all matter expands when its temperature increases and contracts when its temperature decreases. A common thermometer measures temperature by showing the expansion and contraction of a liquid usually mercury or colored alcohol, in a glass tube using a scale. Temperature is generally measured on one of three different scales. Fire ants linked to entomology. The surface temperature of some deserts in Africa and Central Asia reached 60 degrees Celsius, 140 Fahrenheit. This is hot, but not too hot for a species of ant that thrives at this searing temperature. These desert ants can forage for food at temperatures too high for lizards who eat them. Resistant to heat, these ants can withstand higher temperatures than any other creature in the desert. They scavenge the desert surface for corpses of those who did not find cover in time, touching the hot sand as little as possible while often sprinting on forelegs with too high in the air. Although their foraging paths zigzag all over the desert floor, their return paths are almost straight lines to their nest holes. They attain speeds of 100 body lengths per second. 
during an average six-day life, most of these ants retrieve 15 to 20 times their weight in food. Celsius scale. On the most widely used temperature scales, the Celsius scale, the number zero is assigned to the temperature at which water freezes and the number 100 to the temperature at which water boils at standard atmospheric pressure. The gap between freezing and boiling is divided into 100 equal parts called degrees. Fahrenheit scale. On the temperature scale used commonly in the United States, the Fahrenheit scale, the number 32, designates the temperature at which water freezes, and the number 212 is assigned to the temperature at which water boils at one atmosphere. The Fahrenheit scale will become obsolete if and when the United States goes metric. Kelvin scale. The scale used in scientific research is the SI scale, the Kelvin scale. Its degrees are the same size as the Celsius degree and are called Kelvins. On the Kelvin scale, the number zero is assigned to the lowest possible temperature, absolute zero. At absolute zero, a substance has no kinetic energy to give up. Zero on the Kelvin scale, or absolute zero, corresponds to negative 273 degrees Celsius on the Celsius scale. We will learn more about the Kelvin scale in chapter 24. Scale conversion. Arithmetic formulas can be used for converting from one temperature scale to another and are often popular in classroom exams. Such arithmetic exercises are not really physics, so we will not be concerned with them here. Besides, a conversion from Celsius to Fahrenheit, or vice versa, can be very closely approximated by simply reading the corresponding temperature from the side-by-side -side scales in figure 21.1. Temperature and kinetic energy. Temperature is related to the random motions of the molecules in a substance. In the simplest case of an ideal gas, temperature is proportional to the average kinetic energy of molecular translational motion, that is, motion along a straight or curved path. Figure 21.1. This thermometer measures temperature on both Fahrenheit and Celsius scales. In solids and liquids where molecules are more constrained and have potential energy, temperature is more complicated, but it is still true that temperature is closely related to the average kinetic energy of translational motion and molecules. The higher the temperature of a substance, the faster is the motion of its molecules. So the warmth you feel when you touch a hot surface is the kinetic energy transferred by molecules in the surface to the molecules in your fingers. Note that temperature is not a measure of the total kinetic energy of all the molecules in a substance. There is twice as much kinetic energy in two liters of boiling water as in one liter. But the temperatures of both liters of water are the same because the average kinetic energy of molecules in each is the same. Figure 21.2 shows that a bucket of warm water can contain more molecular kinetic energy than a cup of hot water. Concept check. What is the relationship between the temperature of a substance and the speed of its molecules? Figure 21.2. There is more molecular kinetic energy in the bucket full of warm water than in the small cupful of higher temperature water. 21.2. Heat. If you touch a hot stove, energy enters your hand from the stove because the stove is warmer than your hand. But if you touch ice, energy passes from your hand into the colder ice. The direction of spontaneous energy transfer is always from a warmer to a cooler substance. The energy that transfers from 
one object to another because of a temperature difference between them is called heat. It is common, but incorrect with physics types, to think that matter contains heat. Matter contains energy in several forms, but it does not contain heat. Heat is energy in transit, moving from a body of higher temperature to one of lower temperature. Discover. Can you trust your senses? One, put some hot water, some warm water, and some cold water in three open containers. Two, place a finger in the hot water and a finger of the other hand in the cold water. How do they feel? Three, after a few seconds, place both fingers in the warm water. How do they feel now? Think, why is a thermometer better for measuring temperature? Once transferred, the energy ceases to be heat. In chapter nine, we call the energy resulting from heat flow thermal energy to make clear its link to heat and temperature. In this and following chapters, we will use the term that scientists prefer, internal energy. When heat flows from one object or substance to another one, it is in contact with the objects or substances are in thermal contact. Figure 21.3 uses an analogy to show how heat flows between two objects in thermal contact. When two substances of different temperatures are in thermal contact, heat flows from the higher temperature substance into the lower temperature substance. Figure 21.3, just as water will not flow uphill by itself, regardless of the relative amounts of water in the reservoir, heat will not flow from a cooler substance into a hotter substance by itself. However, heat will not necessarily flow from a substance with more total molecular kinetic energy to a substance with less. For example, there is more total molecular kinetic energy in a large bowl of warm water than there is in a hot, red-hot thumbtack. Yet, if the tack is immersed in the water, heat does not flow from the water to the tack. It flows from the hot tack to the cooler water. Heat flows according to temperature difference, that is, average molecular kinetic energy differences. Heat never flows on its own from a cooler substance into a hotter substance. Concept check, what causes heat to flow? 21.3, thermal equilibrium. After objects in thermal contact with each other reach the same temperature, we say that the objects are in thermal equilibrium. When objects are in thermal equilibrium, no heat flows between them. To read a thermometer, we wait until it reaches thermal equilibrium with the substance being measured. When a thermometer is in contact with a substance, heat flows between them until they have the same temperature. The temperature of the thermometer is also the temperature of the substance. So a thermometer, interestingly enough, shows only its own temperature. This is shown in figure 21.4. A thermometer should be small enough that it does not appreciably alter the temperature of the substance being measured. If you are measuring the temperature of room air, then the heat absorbed by the thermometer will not lower the air temperature noticeably. But if you are trying to measure the temperature of a drop of water, the temperature of the drop after thermal contact may be quite different from its initial temperature. Concept check. How does a thermometer measure temperature? Figure 21.4.
somewhat like water in the pipe seeking a common level for which the pressures at equal elevations are the same. The thermometer and its immediate surroundings reach a common temperature at which the average kinetic energy per particle is the same for both. Think. Suppose you use a flame to add a certain quantity of heat to one liter of water and the water temperature rises by two degrees Celsius. If you add the same quantity of heat to two liters of water, how much will its temperature rise? Its temperature will rise by one degree Celsius because there is twice as many molecules in two liters of water and each molecule receives only half as much energy on average. So average kinetic energy and temperature increase by half as much. 21.4 internal energy. In addition to translational kinetic energy of jostling molecules in a substance, there is energy in other forms. There is rotational kinetic energy of molecules and kinetic energy due to internal movements of atoms within molecules. There is also potential energy due to the forces between molecules. The grand total of all energies inside a substance is called internal energy. A substance does not contain heat. It has internal energy. When a substance takes in or gives off heat, its internal energy changes. Absorbed heat may make the molecules of a substance jostle faster. In other words, as when ice is melting, a substance absorbs heat without an increase in temperature. The substance changes phase, the subject of chapter 23. Notes, no matter how cold an object is, it always has some internal energy. Concept check, what happens to the internal energy of a substance that takes in or gives off heat? 21.5, measurement of heat. So we see that heat is energy transferred from one substance to another by a temperature difference. The amount of heat transferred can be determined by measuring the temperature change of a known mass of a substance that absorbs the heat. When a substance absorbs heat, the resulting temperature change depends on more than just the mass of the substance, as shown in figure 21.5. The quantity of heat that brings a cup full of soup to a boil might raise the temperature of the pot of soup by only a few degrees. 21.5. Although the same quantity of heat is added to both containers, the temperature of the container with less water increases more. Think. Which will raise the temperature more, adding one calorie or 4.186 joules? Both are the same. This is like asking which is longer, a mile long track or a 1.6 kilometer long track. They're the same quantity expressed in different units. To quantify heat, we must specify the mass and kind of substance affected. The unit of heat is defined as the heat necessary to produce some standard agreed on temperature change for a specified mass of material. The most commonly used unit for heat is the calorie. The calorie is defined as the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. The kilocalorie is 1,000 calories. The heat required to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water, one degree Celsius. The heat unit used in rating foods is actually a kilocalorie, although it's often referred to as the calorie. To distinguish it from the smaller calorie, the food unit is sometimes called a calorie written with a capital C. A woman with an average diet consumes and expends about 2,000 calories per day. The energy used by her body is eventually given off as heat. 
how many joules per second does her body give off? We find this by converting 2,000 calories per day to joules per second. We use the information that one calorie equals 4,186 joules, one day equals 24 hours, and one hour equals 3,600 seconds. The conversion is then set up as follows. 2,000 calories per day times one day per 24 hours times one hour per 3,600 seconds times 4,186 joules per one calorie, and that's with a capital C. 97 joules per second, which equals 97 watts. Notice that the original quantity, 2,000 calories per day, is multiplied by a set of fractions in which the numerator equals the denominator. Since each fraction has the value 1, multiplying by it does not change the value of the original quantity. The rule for choosing which quantity to put in the numerator is that the units should cancel and reduce to those of the end results. We call this technique dimensional analysis. On average, the woman emits heat at a rate of 97 joules per second, which is 97 watts. This is nearly the same as a glowing 100 watt lamp. It's easy to see why a crowded room soon becomes warm. It's important to remember that the calorie and the calorie, capital C, are units of energy. In the International System of Units, SI, quantity of heat is measured in joules, the SI unit for all forms of energy. The relationship between calories and joules is that one calorie equals 4.186 joules. In this book, we'll learn about heat with the conceptually similar calorie. But in the lab, you may use the joule equivalent where an input of 4.186 joules raises the temperature of one gram of water one degree Celsius. The energy value in food is determined by burning the food and measuring the energy that is released as heat. Food and other fuels are rated by how much energy a certain mass of fuel gives off as heat when burned. Concept check. How could you determine the amount of heat transferred to a substance? 21.6 to the Weight Watcher, the peanut contains 10 calories. To the physicist, it releases 10,000 calories, or 41,860 joules of energy when burned or digested. 21.6, specific heat capacity. Almost everyone has noticed that some foods remain hot much longer than others. Boiled onions and Moist squash on a hot dish, for example, are often too hot to eat while mashed potatoes may be just right. The filling of hot apple pie can burn your tongue while the crust will not, even when the pie has just been taken out of the oven. The aluminum covering on a frozen dinner can be peeled off with your bare fingers as soon as it is removed from the oven as shown in figure 21.7 but be careful of the food beneath it. Different substances have different capacities for storing internal energy or heat. Figure 21.7. You can touch the aluminum pan of the frozen dinner soon after it has been taken from the hot oven, but you'll burn your fingers if you touch the food it contains. The capacity of a substance to store heat depends on its chemical composition. If we heat a pot of water on a stove, we may find that it requires 15 minutes to raise it from room temperature to the boiling temperature. But if we were to put an equal mass of iron on the same flame, we would find that it would raise through the same temperature range 
in only two minutes. For silver, the time would be less than a minute. A specific material requires a specific amount of heat to raise the temperature of a given mass of the material by a specific number of degrees. The specific heat capacity of a material is the quantity of heat required to raise the temperature of a unit mass of the material by one degree. Think, which has a higher specific heat capacity, water or sand? Explain. Water has a greater heat capacity than sand. Water is much slower to warm in the hot sun and slower to cool in the cold nights. Water has more thermal inertia. Sand's low heat capacity as evidenced by how quickly the surface warms in the morning sun and how quickly it cools at night affects local climates. We can think of specific heat capacity as thermal inertia. Recall that inertia is a term used in mechanics to signify the resistance of an object to change in its state of motion. Specific heat capacity is like a thermal inertia since it signifies the resistance of a substance to change in its temperature. Absorbed energy can affect substances in different ways. Absorbed energy that increases the translational speed of molecules is responsible for increases in temperature. Absorbed energy may also increase the rotation of molecules, increase the internal vibrations within molecules, or stretch intermolecular bonds and be stored as potential energy. These kinds of energy, however, are not measured by a substance's temperature. Temperature is a measure only of the kinetic energy of translational motion. Generally, only part of the energy absorbed by a substance raises its temperature, whereas a gram of water requires one calorie of energy to raise the temperature one degree Celsius, it takes only about one-eighth as much energy to raise the temperature of a gram of iron by the same amount. Iron atoms in the iron lattice primarily shake back and forth in translational fashion, while water molecules soak up a lot of energy in rotations, internal vibrations, and bond stretching. Notes. If you add one calorie, 4.186 joules of heat, to one gram of water, you'll raise its temperature by one Celsius degree. So water absorbs more heat per gram than iron for the same change in temperature. Water has a higher specific heat capacity, sometimes simply called specific heat, than iron. Concept check. Why do different substances have different capacities to store heat? Do the math. How many calories are needed to raise the temperature of one liter of water 15 degrees Celsius. When we know the specific heat capacity, C, for a particular substance, then the quantity of heat, Q, involved when the mass, M, of the substance undergoes a temperature change, delta T, is Q equals MC delta T. Heat transferred equals mass times specific heat capacity times temperature change. The specific heat capacity for water, C, is 1 calorie per gram degree Celsius, and the mass of 1 liter of water is 1 kilogram, which is 1,000 grams. Since C is expressed in calories per gram degree Celsius, we express the mass of water, M, in grams. Then, Q equals MC delta T. Q equals 1,000 grams times 1 calorie per gram degree Celsius times 15 degrees, which equals 15,000 calories. Suppose we deliver this energy to the water with a 1,000 watt immersion heater. How long will it take to heat the water? We know that 1,000 watts delivered energy at the rate of 1,000 joules per second. Converting calories to joules, 15,000 calories times 4.186 joules per calorie equals 63,000 joules. At the rate of 1,000 joules per second, the time required for heating the water 
by 15 degrees Celsius is 63 seconds, a little bit more than a minute. 21.7, the high specific heat capacity of water. Water has a much higher capacity for storing energy than most common materials. A relatively small amount of water absorbs a great deal of heat for a correspondingly small temperature rise. Because of this, water is very useful cooling agent and is used in cooling systems in automobiles and other engines. If a liquid of lower specific heat capacity were used in cooling systems, its temperature would rise higher for a comparable absorption of heat. Of course, if the temperature of the liquid rises to the temperature of the engine, no further cooling will take place. Water also takes longer to cool, a useful fact to your great-grandparents who on cold winter nights likely used foot warming hot water bottles in their beds. Water's capacity to store heat also affects the global climate as shown in figure 21.8. Water takes more energy to heat up than land does. The property of water to resist changes in temperature improves the climate in many places. Europe and the west coast of the United States both benefit from this property of water, climate of Europe. The next time you are looking at a world globe, notice the high latitude of Europe. Figure 21.8. Water has a high specific heat and is transparent, so it takes more energy to heat up than land does. If water did not have a high heat capacity, the countries of Europe would be as cold as the northeastern regions of Canada, for both Europe and Canada get about the same amount of the sun's energy per square kilometer. The Atlantic current known as the Gulf Stream brings warm water northeast from the Caribbean. It holds much of its internal energy long enough to reach the North Atlantic off the coast of Europe where it then cools. The energy released one calorie per degree for each gram of water that cools is carried by the prevailing westerly winds over the European continent. Climate of America. Similarly, the climates differ on the east and west coasts of North America. The prevailing winds in the latitudes of North America are westerly. On the west coast, air moves from the Pacific Ocean to the land. Because of water's high heat capacity, ocean temperature does not vary much from summer to winter. The water is warmer than the air in the winter and cooler than the air in the summer. In winter, the water warms the air that moves over it and warms the western coastal region of North America. In summer, the water cools the air and the western coastal regions are cooled. On the east coast, air moves from the land to the Atlantic Ocean. Land, with a lower specific heat capacity, gets hot in the summer, but cools rapidly in the winter. As a result of water's high heat capacity and the wind directions, the west coast city of San Francisco is warmer in the winter and cooler in the summer than the East Coast city of Washington, D.C., which is at about the same latitude. The central interior of a large continent usually experiences extremes of temperature. For example, the high summer and low winter temperatures common in Manitoba and the Dakotas are largely due to the absence of large bodies of water. Europeans, islanders, and people living near ocean air currents should be glad that water has such high specific heat capacity. San Franciscans are. Note, water is king when it comes to specific heat capacity. Concept check, 
what is the effect of water's high specific heat capacity on climate? 21.8, thermal expansion. When the temperature of a substance is increased, its molecules jiggle faster and normally tend to move farther apart. This results in an expansion of the substance. Most forms of matter, solids, liquids, and gases, expand when they are heated and contract when they are cooled. You can see an example of this in figure 21.9. For comparable pressures and comparable changes in temperature, gases generally expand or contract much more than liquids, and liquids expand or contract more than solids. Figure 21.9, the extreme heat of a July day in Asbury Park, New Jersey, caused the buckling of these railroad tracks. This thermal expansion of solids must be accounted for in construction. It also has applications in certain electronic devices, expansion joints. If concrete sidewalks and highway paving were laid down in a continuous piece, cracks would appear due to the expansion and contraction brought about by the differences between summer and winter temperatures. To prevent this, the surface is laid in small sections, each one being separated from the next by a small gap that is filled with a substance such as tar. On a hot summer day, expansion often squeezes this material out of the joints. The expansion of materials must be allowed for the construction of structures and devices of all kinds. Different materials expand at different rates. A dentist uses filling material that has the same rate of expansion as teeth. The aluminum pistons of an automobile engine are enough smaller in diameter than the steel cylinders to allow for much greater expansion rate of aluminum. A civil engineer uses steel having the same expansion rate as concrete for reinforcing cement. Long steel bridges often have one end fixed while the other rests on rockers that allow for expansion. The roadway itself is segmented with tongue and groove types gaps called expansion joints as shown in figure 2110. Notes. Thermal expansion and contraction account for the creaky noises often heard in the attics of old houses on cold nights. Figure 2110. This gap is called an expansion joint and it allows the bridge to expand and contract. Why is it advisable to allow telephone lines to sag when stringing them between poles in summer? Telephone lines are longer in summer when they are warmer and shorter in winter when they are cooler. They therefore sag more on hot summer days than in winter. If telephone lines are not strung with enough sag in summer, they might contract too much and snap during the winter. Do the math. Consider the expansion of a make-believe, snugly fitting steel pipe that completely encircles Earth. How much longer would this 40 million meter long pipe be if its temperature increased by one degree Celsius. Steel changes its length by about one part per 100,000 for each Celsius degree in temperature. This ratio is one over 100,000. For different lengths of steel, expansion follows the same proportion. For short lengths of steel, expansion might be negligible. For the pipe, the ratio of its change in length x to its full size is the same as the ratio above. For one degree Celsius temperature change, one over 100,000 equals x meters over 
40 million meters. A little computation will show that the change in length x is 400 meters. Here's the interesting part. If such a pipe were elongated by this 400 meters, then there would be a gap between, the, between it and the Earth's surface. Would the gap be big enough to put this book under, to crawl under, to drive a truck under? How big would the gap be? We can find the gap by ratio and proportion. The ratio of circumference C to diameter D for any circle is equal to pi, about 3.14. The ratio of the change in circumference delta C to the change in delta D also has the same value. Delta C over delta D equals 400 meters divided by delta D, which equals 3.14. Delta D equals 400 meters divided by 3.14 equals 127.4 meters. This 127.4 meter is the increase in diameter of the circular pipe. The size of the gap between Earth's surface and the expanded pipe is equal to the increase in radius, which is half the increase in diameter, or 63.7 meters. So if a steel pipe that fits snugly against Earth were increased in temperature by one degree Celsius, perhaps by people all along its length breathing hard on it, the pipe would expand and stand an amazing 63.7 meters off the ground. Using ratio and proportions is a straightforward way to solve many problems. Another way to solve for the expansion of material involves a formula, delta L equals alpha L naught delta T. You will encounter this formula in the lab part of your course. Bimetallic strips. In a bimetallic strip, two strips of different metals, say one of brass and the other of iron, are welded or riveted together as shown in figure 2111. When the strip is heated, the difference in amounts of expansion of brass and iron shows up easily. One side of the double strip becomes longer than the other, causing the strip to bend into a curve. On the other hand, when the strip is cooled, it bends in the opposite direction because the metal that expands the most also contracts the most. The movement of the strip may be used to turn a pointer, regulate a valve, or operate a switch. Figure 2111. In a bimetallic strip, brass expands or contracts more when heated or cooled than does iron, so the strip bends as shown. Thermostats. A thermostat such as the one in figure 2112 is a practical application of a bimetallic strip that is used to control temperature. As the temperature of the room changes, the back and forth bending of the bimetallic coil opens and closes an electric circuit. When the room becomes too cool, the coil bends towards the brass side, and in so doing, it closes an electric switch that turns on the heat. When the room becomes too warm, the coil bends towards the iron side, which opens the switch and turns off the heating unit. Refrigerators are equipped with special thermostats to prevent them from becoming too hot or too cold. Bimetallic strips are used in oven thermometers, electric toasters, and other devices. Figure 2112, when the bimetallic coil expands in a thermostat, the mercury rolls away from the electric contacts and breaks the circuit. When the coil contracts, the mercury rolls against the contacts and completes the electric circuit. Discover. How can you open a tightly closed jar? Find a glass jar with a metal lid that is difficult to open. Heat the lid by placing it in a stream of hot water and momentarily placing it on a hot stove. 
Try to unscrew the lid. What happens? Think. Why is the jar easier to open after the metal lid is heated? Glass. How much a substance expands depends on its change in temperature. If one part of the piece of glass is heated or cooled more rapidly than adjacent parts, the expansion or contraction that results may break the glass. This is especially true for thick glass. Borosilicate glass is formulated to expand very little with increasing temperature. Concept check. How does matter change when heated or cooled? 21.9 Expansion of Water Almost all liquids will expand when they are heated. Ice cold water, however, does just the opposite. Water at the temperature of melting ice, 0 degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit, contracts when the temperature is increased. This is most unusual. As the water is heated and its temperature rises, it continues to contract until it reaches a temperature of 4 degrees Celsius. With further increase in temperature, the water then begins to expand. The expansion continues all the way to the boiling water 100 degrees Celsius. This odd behavior is shown graphically in figure 2113 on the next page. A given amount of water has its smallest volume and thus its greatest density at 4 degrees Celsius. Study the graph carefully. Figure 2113, the graph shows the change in volume of water with increasing temperature. The same amount of water has its largest volume and smallest density in its solid form ice. Remember, ice floats in water, so it must be less dense than water. The volume of ice at zero degrees Celsius is not shown in figure 2113. If it were plotted to the same exaggerated scale, the graph would extend far below the top of the page. After water has turned to ice, further cooling causes it to contract. The expansion for this behavior of water has to do with the odd crystal structure of ice. The crystals of most solids are structured so that the solid state occupies a smaller volume than the liquid state. Ice, however, has open structured crystals as shown in figure 2114. Figure 2114. Water molecules in their crystal form have an open structured six-sided arrangement. As a result, water expands upon freezing and ice is less dense than water. These crystals result from the angular shape of water molecule, plus the fact that the forces binding water molecules together are strongest at certain angles. Water molecules in this open structure occupy a greater volume than they do in the liquid state. At zero degrees Celsius, ice is less dense than water, and so ice floats on water, melting ice. When ice melts, not all the open structured crystals collapse. Some crystals remain in the ice water mixture, which make up a microscopic slush that slightly bloats the water, increasing its volume slightly. Figure 2115, the six-sided structure of a snowflake is a result of the six-sided ice crystals that make it up. Ice water is therefore less dense than slightly warmer water. With an increase in temperature, more of the remaining ice crystals collapse. The melting of these crystals further decreases the volume of the water. While crystals are collapsing as the temperature increases between 0 and 10 degrees Celsius, Increased molecular motion results in expansion. The effect is shown in the center graph in figure 2116. Whether ice crystals are in the water or not, increased vibrational motion of the molecules increases the volume of the water. When we combine the effects of contraction and expansion, 
the curve looks like the right hand graph in figure 2116 or figure 2113. This behavior of water is of great importance in nature. Suppose that the greatest density of water were at its freezing point, as is true of most liquids. Figure 2116. The collapsing of ice crystals left plus increased molecular motion with increasing temperature center combined to make water most dense at 4 degrees Celsius on the right. Then the coldest water would settle to the bottom and the ponds would freeze from the bottom up. Pond organisms would then be destroyed in winter months. Fortunately, this does not happen. The densest water which settles on the bottom of the pond is 4 degrees Celsius above the freezing temperature. Water at the freezing point, 0 degrees Celsius, is less dense and floats, so ice forms at the surface while the pond remains liquid below the ice freezing water. Let's examine this in more detail. Most of the cooling in a pond takes place at the surface when the surface air is colder than the water. As the surface water is cooled, it becomes denser and sinks to the bottom. Water will float at the surface for further cooling only if it is as dense or less dense than the water below. Consider a pond that is initially at, say, 10 degrees Celsius. It cannot possibly be cooled to 0 degrees Celsius without first being cooled to 4 degrees Celsius. And water at 4 degrees Celsius cannot remain at the surface for further cooling unless all the water below has at least an equal density. That is, unless all the water below is at 4 degrees Celsius. If the water below the surface is any temperature other than 4 degrees Celsius, any surface water at 4 degrees Celsius will be denser and sink before it can cool further. So before any ice can form, all the water in the pond must be cooled to 4 degrees Celsius. Only when this condition is met can the surface water be cooled to 3, 2, 1, and 0 degrees Celsius without sinking. Then ice can form as shown in figure 2117. Thus, the water at the surface is first to freeze. Continued cooling of the pond results in the freezing of the water next to the ice. So a pond freezes from the surface downward. In a cold winter, the ice will be thicker than in a milder winter. Very deep bodies of water are not ice covered even in the coldest of winters. Notes. Water's density at 4 degrees Celsius means that all ponds and lakes freeze from the top down, as the surface must always freeze first. Figure 2117. As water is cooled at the surface, it sinks until the entire lake is 4 degrees Celsius. Only then can the surface water cool to 0 degrees Celsius without sinking. This is because all the water in a lake must be cooled to 4 degrees Celsius before lower temperatures can be reached and the winter is not long enough for all the water to be cooled to 4 degrees Celsius. If only some of the water is 4 degrees Celsius, it will lie on the bottom. Because of water's high specific heat and poor ability to conduct heat, the bottom of deep lakes in cold regions is a constant 4 degrees Celsius the year round. Fish should be glad that this is so. Concept check. Why does ice float on water? Summary. Thermal part one. Temperature, heat, and expansion. Heat transferred can be found by measuring the temperature change of a known mass of substance that absorbs heat. The capacity of a substance to store heat depends on its 
chemical composition. The property of water to resist changes in temperature improves the climate. Most forms of matter expand when they are heated and contract when they are cooled. At zero degrees Celsius, ice is less dense than water, and so ice floats on water.